Hey, this is Stu, and of course normally I'd be saying here I am at the beautiful Purple Valley, but that would be a lie because we're not actually. We're here at Palm Grove, which is John Scott's luxury hideaway when he's <laughs> skiving away from Purple Valley. And we've had him here for two weeks uh, at Purple Valley, and now we're following up the beach uh, to grab an interview, and we're also going to do a little bit of a demo a little bit later. Fantastic to talk to you again, John. Thanks for sparing the time for us. Thank you, Stu, for the lovely introduction. <laughs> it is my, my hideaway, <laughs> although most of the participants come out to Palm Grove to have yeah. sunbathing and food and drink. And you may even be able to catch a glimpse behind us. There's actually a shala as well behind us here. So My teaching team and I come out here to practice on our afternoons when we're not doing technique workshops. So perfect, yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. That's no, beautiful. It's so with this interview, I know we've interviewed John you know, a couple of times, and this interview I wanted to focus on what I'd experienced really during the last, well, probably a month, because you were here with David and Gretchen yes. first. Um, so I was there in the Mysore practice um, and experienced some of John's teachings and the way he teaches, so I thought I'd try and get him to talk a little bit about that in this interview, so you get a feel for where John's coming from. So the first thing, John, is... Um, we started every day with a meditation and then some pranayama and you were talking about leading us into the three-dimensional breath to get us going ready for the Surinamaskars. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we start with a good complicated one. That's a good one, Stu. Um, for me, the, the most important thing is to make the practice a meditation. I was once asked what's changed for me and what's really changed for me is that I treat the practice not just as an exercise. We, we are exercising, but if we only focus on the exercise, it takes us outward. And that's powerful. But Guruji talked about yoga as being empowering. And so over the years, what's really changed for me is my uh, attitude towards my practice is one more of a, uh, the keystone or the cornerstone to my day and to start off in silence is a beautiful way to start, especially in the morning because it's the easiest time to be quiet. To just arrive on the mat, stand in summer steady, without any preparation means you haven't had a chop an opportunity to, let's say, put to the side the day's activities or what we might be doing for the day. A list of things. You could waste five, six vinyasas, couldn't you, before yeah, you before clear you, the mind? Before you clear them, mm. exactly. And so for, for me, uh, especially at the retreat center, it's really nice also to bring everyone from, they've all arrived from bed, not having come on the scooter or some have, but I mean the tube, the train, we're all living together. And so it's nice to then combine our energy to really seal it. So often I also te uh, chant the teacher's chant to just accentuate the fact that we've all come together to work on the principles of yoga, to have a, a great focus together. And so for me, rather than being on a retreat where people come in and do their individual practice within a group, I want them to experience the group energy, the group focus. So the whole key for me to bring them together sitting and then once we've sat for say 20 minutes, I then chant and I chant the punamada, punamidam, which is to sort of bring us into me, for me, into a, a held space of love. Mm. From there I then introduce um, what I call the focus 12. Uh, Guruji would count 10 breaths, it used to be 25 breaths, but uh, when I watched Guruji counting on his hand, he, he counted in the Vedic way, which is to take the spiral. Right. We count to 12, multiples of 12. And so I take uh, the group through 12 focus breaths. That's to bring them in to, first of all, posture, free breathing, and looking place. So Guruji's three points are always with me, that I want to start arriving in body, aligning body, to then align the subtle body, which is going to be the channels for breath, for prana. When that's all aligned, of course, those two situations coming together set the conditions for the mind to be focused. And they weren't, they weren't challenging breaths as such, are they? They were just nicely metered, consistent. Yeah, about a four or five second exhale yeah. in there. 
Um, and some of the mornings we would go into Ujjayi, but straight after the uh, focus 12, arriving in body, breath, and focus, we then make a move from just being static in the breath to actually appreciating how breath moves through the body, in particular the spine. Yeah. And so then I add in Krishnamacharya's seven breath sequence to wake up the spine, which was that when we went, yes, we the were inhalation was up. extension, the exhalation was flexion. And, and that felt really nice to move yeah. with the breath, as you say, after being sitting and getting the breath going, to actually, it brings it into the consciousness, doesn't it? Yes. So to, to also then realize that it's the breath that's going to be moving the body not the other way around. So when we talk about going to exercise, yes. we usually go full speed and add breath. Where if we start the other way, start off being static, introducing the breath and then the breath moving the body, and then from our static just spinal movement, then going into the vinyasa to go from seated to standing to samasthiti. Yeah. Then at samasthiti, we chant the, the opening mantra. So that means we've all come together. We're then connected in body, we're all connected in breath, we've chanted together, and so we're all in the same focus. And so we've all arrived basically at the same place, the same, uh, let's say, level of consciousness. Yeah. And then you, you, you tended to lead us through the first couple of Surinamaskars as well, or, or on some of the days, again matching the breath and then leaving us to carry on. And there, there was something, you would talk us through the breath, and there was a few things there where Traditionally, or maybe for a lot of people, we would maybe finish the breath at a certain part of the movement. But you were encouraging us to keep the breath going to get the foundation, I think it was, before we moved into the next. Perhaps you could, you're gonna, you guys are going to have to sort of visualize some of this going so, on now. So this is a breathing system. Guruji would say yoga, mind control. Breathing system, counted method. Tristana, vinyasa. So, by bringing everyone to the same body, breath, mind focus, we are able to get out of what I call the ordinary thinking mind, where we're not even engaged in our subject matter. It brings us to the subject matter that we're here to practice yoga this morning. To then, we need to go deeper from subject matter to be subject technical, which is to realize that this is a counted practice. To then get subject specific, which is that it's a meditation. Mm. So it's a dynamic meditation. And so if I don't lead people into that, knowing how the mind works, the moment we sit down to meditate, for example, the mind races off into story. Right. So if we do the opening mantra, and then I just let the, pra the practitioners go straight into their own self-practice, immediately the mind's gone back into where they're the mat's not aligned, or yep. they forgot to take their Who's sweatshirt next to off, them or, or whatever. Oh, really, I should go to the po toilet. And so that, at that moment, what they've done is they've clicked back into their ordinariness, and the mind, the breath, the body are then distracted and separate. After having brought them all together so that the body, breath, mind is in the same place, I want to continue them into this first sun salute and also, like a transcendental meditation teacher, pass the mantra to them. So I count the first one or two, three vinyasas, yeah. I mean, um, sun salutes through, which is a transmission of the mantra, the counted method. When I then set them free, meaning in their own time and rhythm, I then say, now counting internally, an internal count. Yeah. So the student is not only doing the asana self-practice, the breath self-practice, but they're also doing the counting self-practice. So that's why I take it through. In a couple of days you experience, instead of doing a self-practice class, I did a counter class. A counter class, yeah, the whole way. And you talk also about the three-dimensional breath which again we sort of tend to forget a little bit about, don't we? Yeah. Just sort of so let's go back to be pre-class, pre-sitting, arriving in body. What sort of breath are we doing? Very shallow. Very yeah. shallow and it's auto autonomic nervous system. Mm. So it, we could either say the autonomic nervous system is breathing us or something greater is keeping us alive. 
something greater loves us so much, no matter how much we abuse our body, <laughs> it keeps us alive. And we could almost say that that is no dimensional living. One dimensional living is realizing that there is a breath. Two dimensional living is realizing you're breathing in and out. Right. Most asana practitioners are only doing two-dimensional breathing. They haven't even arrived in the physical three-dimensional world because they're only breathing in and out, which uh, is two-dimensional in the sense that there's no awareness of how the bandhas seal the breath in the body, how the bandhas uh, regulate the breath, and how the bandhas also direct the breath throughout the body. Now, the body is a three-dimensional object. Mm. If we're just taking breath in and out, it's only two-dimensional. And sometimes you have to draw on that three-dimension, don't you, in order to find space? Well, here's the question. Is the space is the element ether, space. It's appreciated through the sense of hearing. And so we, if we listen to the sound, Guruji would say, make noise. So first, Guruji would say, no holding the breath, no stiff breathing, make noise with sound, free breathing, free breathing ujjayi. We're trying to develop ujjayi in the asana. So when we arrive in downward dog, we want equal exhalation inhalation. Mm. Most people are still doing a longer exhalation and a short inhalation. The inhalation doesn't match the exhalation, so we're not really breathing correctly. So, so then when he says free breathing, does he, is he saying without conscious control of the length of it, or what does he mean by that? Because for me, free breathing means letting it do what it wants to do, but that's not what we're doing, is it? He means free breathing, meaning no catching, stiff or stopping. No stopping, okay, freely no stopping. moving. It's going in and out. Ah, okay, freely okay, So free breathing means in and out, but you could also play with the fact that if the asana is difficult to get into, Pajvakonasana B, yeah. take a few extra breaths, you're not being charged for it, you're yeah. not being taxed for it. Under the vinyasa system, Dwe is an exhale. Yes. And then there's the first inhale of the first breath of the five breaths. You can mark on a mental blackboard or a whiteboard, I've taken one, two extra breaths to get into this pose. Yeah. You're not being charged for it, but you're being accountable. So the vinyasa teaches you to be accountable. So you can take as many breaths as you like, but don't make it stiff, don't stop it. Let the breath be moving the body. But when you arrive in the state, the asana, yeah. there you're trying to, to be sterasukha, in foundation, in alignment, in the posture with the correct looking place comfortable with space to receive the fullness of that inhalation. Mm. And I know you mentioned as well a few times, not directly to everybody in the class, but I heard, you know, while my focus is so one-pointed, I also have you guys in mind that I'm also listening to everything John is saying so I can bring it to you. <laughs> I heard you say a couple of times to people, um, this asana is difficult, you may need to breathe quicker. Yes. Yeah. In my mind, it's always been a, like the same meter as the Surinamaskars maintained through the whole practice. And if it's difficult, well, it's just harder to maintain that rhythm. But, so then that's part of the work. So uh, let's start from the beginner. Yeah. It's very aerobic. So you're going to be doing more free breathing. You don't want them to be staccato, stiff breathing. And, and gasping for it. Yeah. So, that's where we could say that the dynamic movement, the vinyasa, are free breaths. Mm. And they can fluctuate. The inhalation can be shorter than the exhalation. And we can talk about that. The next question <laughs> is that, yes, in the sun salutes, especially sun salute B, I overlap yes. my exhalation to make my foundational change so that I get about a, let's say, a four-beat exhalation and a three-beat inhalation. Mm but I'm making sure I get a, at least a three-beat inhalation. We'll note that Pancha, upward dog, Sapta, the warrior, yeah. um, Nava, the upward dog, 
Ekadasha, the warrior, they are the hardest ones to get the inhalations. Yeah. But if you take the move before, which is an exhalation, if you make your foundational change and begin the movement into the next vinyasa, you will then have um, a shorter length of movement to get the fullness of inhalation. Yeah. So say, so warrior, if you're starting to inhale from here to get your arms all the way up, the move's too long. But if you've changed your feet, started coming up, then inhale, you're not stiffening the breath, you're not holding the breath, what you're doing is stretching the exhalation, yeah. and it's a little bit like samavritti. When we're doing samavritti, we're stretching the exhalation and matching the inhalation to that. We only stretch a little bit more if the inhalation will match it. Right. If we don't match it, we have to go back to get ujjayi. Ujjayi is an equal inhalation to the exhalation. Yes, and so when we arrive in a difficult asana, as a beginner, downward dog is difficult. Mm. And they might be doing a, a one one ratio of breath or right. a two two ratio. You and I will be up to easily a four four in our downward dog. Yeah. Guruji would then qualify and say, not too slow or not too long. Because if we then stay too long in the asana, then it becomes too cooling. So what would he what would he call too long? So if we if we thought of each count as containing a count. Let's like, say a three second yeah. out, three second in Ujjayi is, in the state. Right. Yeah. Four is a little too long. Four is a little too so long. So on the okay. fifth exhale of downward dog, yeah. I make it four. Right. Before jumping on Sapta mm. or jumping on Panchadasha. Mm. So on that extension of the exhalation, I'm shifting my dog to a cat to fly forward fly on the forward. inhalation. Because also on this breath, some people would say, okay, keep the breath exactly the same, and if the movement requires going from down dog up into warrior one, then you move quicker. But you keep the tempo of the breath the same, but then when you're lowering back down, you might have to move slower in order to make the movement last the same length as the breath. Let's look at it from a different perspective. Indeed, why not? <laughs> Yoga chikitsa. Yep. Yoga therapy, primary series. Let's use it as a principle of practice. That yoga chikitsa to me means structure. You've got to get the structure first. Hands and feet, limbs supporting the spine. And that, that could then be very sort of staccato in style. What we're then trying, and we could make the sun salute very much a yoga chikitsa. But we could also make the sun salute then a nadi shodana. To me, Nadi Shodana means not just second series or intermediate series, it means a principle of, of, of practice. That the Nadi Shodana, the Nadis are cleansed. If the Nadis are cleansed, meaning unblocked, because the structure is aligned, mm. if we're aligning the physical structure, we're also aligning the subtle body, the Nadis. Which then means the breathing becomes a flow. So you learn structure, flow. A third series, Sun Salute, Stirabhaga, is one that has grace. That the synchronicity is then perfect. Right. What you're talking about doing, if you try and do Stirabhaga from the beginning without having the structure okay. or the flow, you're not going to achieve it, you're just going to stiffen the breath yeah. or stiffen the body. Okay. It doesn't cool. match. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you're, you're changing it depending on the level of the practitioner. Exactly. And like we should be doing for everything. Really. Exactly. Yeah. And, but, but as a rule of thumb, the vinyasa are free breaths. Yeah. And they can be expressive. That akam is certainly a shorter distance than dwe. Yeah. And chitwari is a much bigger distance to travel on a breath than akam. Yeah. So they have to be different. If you make them 3-3 three, three or 4-4, four, four, you're either exaggerating one or starving the other. Mm. It doesn't make sense. Free breathing means don't hold the breath, let the body move freely, and briskly you take, Guruji would say. Mm. So the vinyasa is brisk, efficient, not rushed, then you arrive. Right. And when you arrive, the first breath in the posture might be 2-2. Two, two. The next one might be 3-3. Three, three. 
so in a sense you do summer vritti in the pose for the first three breaths and maybe the last two breaths might be three 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 and yeah. you're comfortable you're in stira sukha and so what about postures like ujita hatha balangastasana faster faster but there isn't that cannot people just fall into the trap of bloody hell this is tough i'll do a few quick breaths and i'll be out and finished before i True. i know it yeah and but they know they're doing that. <laughs> so they do, I suppose they do. They do yeah. their conscious work, 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 yeah. work on that. Yeah. So it's like, because I often think, well, okay, yeah, it's tough, but then you get better by sticking in that toughness without yes. making it stilted yeah. and you know, if you're holding, by working If you're holding it, your leg up like that, yeah. you can't go... No. <laughs> we have one, a go. <laughs> two, and it starts to go down like exactly. this. You've got to pump it up. <laughs> <laughs> a few quick breaths and bring it back up again. Yeah, it's got a match. It's okay. like a spaghetti western. You remember the old days of Cowboys and Indians? Yeah. Where the, the, the film visual never matched the sound. Mm. The sound of the breath has to match the intensity of the pose. The pose. So is this fire breath yeah. or not fire breath? If you're a beginner doing five and you can only hold five, yeah. there'll be five fast breaths. Yeah. As, a, as a more advanced person, Five is nothing, and so it'd be a really chilled out breath. So again, it's a level of the practitioner, a level of the intensity of the asana. Yeah. Then also, is that a two-dimensional breath or a three-dimensional <laughs> breath that we're talking about, Stu? Yeah. So the three-dimensional breath is that you've arrived in body, you've got stera, meaning steady, balanced, aligned, and you've made a shape, a container that's going to be receiving the breath in and directing it through the body. Yeah. Trikonasana is a beautiful one. Once you've set up the three legs, the arm, the two feet, they're the primary, uh, secondary foundation, and the primary foundation is the pelvis. Those hands and feet, legs and arms, secure the pelvis in place. You then get the length of the breath along the spine. You then get the width of the breath through the arms. With making sure that Uddiyana Bandha and the navel's in, you're able to direct the breath to the back of the heart and the sternum. So we're getting length, width, and depth to the breath. It's three-dimensional. Yeah. What's magic about this is if we go right back to the beginning of the interview, is that why start arriving in body, breath, and focusing? Is because we're wanting it to be a meditation, not an exercise. Mm. What is meditation? Meditation is being a deeper level of concentration that you're fully eventually absorbed into it. And so we could become breath moving into and out of form, dynamically. That's you transcending the ordinary. In that place, time stands still. So when we're in a two-dimensional world, we're ruled by time. When we come to the third dimensional breathing, here we are at that point where we're beginning to, to realize that time's a concept. Your practice can be over in five minutes when it's been a... a it's been a couple of hours. Yeah. yeah. So that really means you've been in a timeless place, although the physical world time has been ticking by. And so what does transcendental meditation to me means, or transcendental ashtanga means, you have transcended your ordinariness. In order to do that, you have to reach a three-dimensional breath. Because we've got object, space, and time. The object is your body moving through space is time. Yeah. But if you're in that place of a three-dimensional breath, and your mind, body, breath are all in one place, you then transcend to a place where you're no longer ordinary, you're extraordinary. So you've left your individual self, name and form disappear. If name and form disappear, so do the limitations. So does the doubt. So does the negativity. So Guru, you would say, oh, too much negative thinking or too much bad thinking, yeah. no mulabandha. 
we need the mulabandha to seal the energy in, and then the uddiyanabandha to direct that breath into that third dimension, to really be focusing on, on, on the breath, and, and, and you'll find that the breath thing gets longer. Uh, that's how we get the ujjayi, yeah. is by working the third dimension. Cause, and sometimes we get little glimpses of that, don't we? During practice, we think, oh wow, yeah, I was so focused. But then we're already thinking about how focused we were, yeah. and then we're off on a, and a so story. And so as we? a meditative practice, we go back to our mantra, yeah. or we go back to the, f to the mindfulness of the breath. Our Ashtanga practice is first it's counting the breath to tie the mind to the breath. So when we're in that moment that we're realizing we're transcending time, or we're in the place of pranic flow, when we have that acknowledgement, the count's disappeared, the series has disappeared, the name of the asana has disappeared, you're just form yeah. without judgment. You know, you're just without judgment, you are it as it is in itself. Mm. The moment we have the realization, it's then stew in triangle on my hamstring. Yeah. We fall back into the, 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 the ordinaries or the conditions that are set. To transcend our, our conditions again, we've got to go back through the steps, back through the process of counting the breath, the bandha, the foundation, steer it to get the third dimension again to transcend it. Yeah. If we change tack for a while and think about um, one of the other things you brought up w was about bending the knees a little bit in the forward folding, thinking of hamstring issues and sit bone pain and, and that sort of stuff. And it's directly also, related to what we've just been talking about. Yeah. So perhaps we could wheedle that and interweave it then. Skillfully, Absolutely. you understand, I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> no stiff breathing. Free breathing. Free breathing is free movement. Vinyasa is free movement. I borrow a mantra from the Bauhaus, the Zion House in Germany, 70s, I think the 70s, 80s, and they had a mantra, form follows function. Mm -hmm. The resultant form is governed by the function of the elements creating that form. And so for me, the form, let's say asana, is governed by the function of all the moving parts, the joints. If the joints are locked and restricted, they restrict or lock the posture. There won't be any sterosuka. It'll just be stiff and locked. Also to remember that when we were born, we were having to support ourselves in relationship to gravity. Mm -hmm. Initially, gravity holds us. And then we work with gravity to become independently self-supporting there's a direct relationship with breath. The exhalation is down into earth. The inhalation is up out of earth. When we're vinyasaing or moving from one pose to another pose, we are carrying our center of gravity over a foundation. If the legs or limbs that are supporting that torso body weight is on straight locked limbs, it's vulnerable a high centre of gravity will fall over or we will brace ourselves, stiffen ourselves to stop falling over. That will have a direct relationship back to breath becoming stiff. In order to be able to keep the bunda efficiently working and the breath efficiently working, you need to, to, to learn then how to have that conversation with gravity that if you bend the knees, exhaling going down to pick up a toe and then you're inhaling raising the center of gravity. Yeah. It becomes Nadi Shodana. If you lock the knees, that's going to lock the Nadis. If you lock the elbows, it's going to lock the Nadis. There's going to be no Nadi Shodana flow. The Nadis need to be opened up. And in the old days, back in the 80s, there was a huge criticism from the Iyengas to the Ashtangis, that the Ashtangis were sloppy, mm -hmm. they had no alignment, that the Iyengas had alignment. They didn't talk Ujjayi, they didn't talk free breathing, they didn't talk Bandha, they just talked 
alignment. Yeah. And from that, the Westerners have made them stiff. Guruji was completely opposite. Why did they say it was sloppy? Because we had bent knees. We were bending our knees to do stuff. You then straighten the leg, not from the kneecap and thigh. So, for example, if I'm, if I'm now releasing from my Padmasana, I'm not just going to pull up on my kneecap and thigh. Yeah. It's just going to stop here. So if I point, really point, and then start working through the shin, through the calf, then the kneecap and thigh. If I then dorsiflex, I'm going to relax the leg, dorsiflex, work through the leg, the calf, then the kneecap and thigh. So similarly, if I'm going to stand, I'm going to put the foot under the floor, work from the toes, through the ankle, up through shin and calf, and kneecap and thigh to lengthen the leg. So it's like an integration of the whole, whole yeah. body, really, rather Raising than just segmentation. Raising the center of gravity up. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, there's the principle of gravity, which gravity is always pulling you down. And we either brace ourselves against that, or we go with the flow. Going with the flow is understanding that gravity has a pushback. It supports you. We ride that pushback on the inhalation. Gravity, the equal and opposite to that is levity. How do the yogis levitate? Magic. <laughs> well, let's say that's a, a future... A, a future Another level, episode. <laughs> a future level of practice. But levity for me means uh, to have a lifted and buoyant heart. Yeah. This is ordinary posture. And this is, you know, this is just laziness. And in this, gravity's got me. My digestion's not going to be good. I'm going to lose health. And this is probably doubt, negativity in the past. If I use some bandha, what I'm actually doing is I'm lifting my heavy heart. I'm supporting my heart. My heart can relax here. Interesting enough, in the Hebrew language, the word lev is heart. In the Oxford Dictionary, levity means buoyant. And so I put the two together, and when I'm sitting here with posture, Guruji's posture, three places, Mulabandha, Uriyandabandha, Jalalabandha, balancing the head, balancing the heart, balancing the pelvis, then I'm sitting in levity. In conversation with gravity, the exhalation's down, the inhalation's up. If I don't have an equal inhalation, exhalation, my exhalation is yeah. If I have only got a little inhalation, this is what tends to happen in our ordinariness. We miss the inhalation. Yeah? And we slump. And we slump. Yeah. And, and we don't want to take that into our posture, into our asanas. Yeah. One of the things we were doing, which was great fun, is you took us through a couple of lead seconds, which was uh, a lot of fun. And you introduced some extra bits. Yeah, we, we did a Hanumanasana, we did uh, like uh, some preps, um, double pigeon before, um, what was it before? It was before Ekapada, yeah. Uh, how much free reign? I know this was a workshop and it's about people experiencing stuff and giving ideas to, to get the, the germs sort of working. Uh, how much free reign do we have in our own practices, normally at home, to add bits in, experiment, knock bits out? Or is there, it's, it's a difficult question to ask, answer, isn't it? Because... No, the answer's a silly stew. Okay. <laughs> the questions are great, but there's so many questions. Yeah. But I'm thinking all the time, Guruji, Guruji, Guruji. Yeah. So start where you, where you will with that bit. We've got absolute free range. This is your self-practice, taught by your teacher. Ultimately, the teacher, Guruji, for example, is introducing you to the lineage of gurus. Vande Gurunam Chananada From the whole history of yoga teaching to this moment, you stand on the mat with the practice in front of you. I come from Ashtanga Yoga Research Institute. Guruji was researching. And as a student of that institute, I'm still researching. 
this trying to answer all of those questions. Yeah, you're doing a grand job. <laughs> so <laughs> there is only one guru lineage, and what the true guru does is pass that to you, to your own inner guru. Traditional practice, yes, you're following the traditional practice, but with tradition is always innovation. Hmm. And so what I'm researching, uh, especially in second series, is uh, with our Western bodies, Stu, it's very difficult either to do a deep back bend yeah. or to do a leg behind head. To have that body that's so complement, to be able to sit in lotus and to sit in varasana equally comfortable is vitally important. So to be able to do a back bend, a forward bend, and a leg behind the head and a twist, to get the body totally balanced like that, if you haven't done the homework, and you're in a second series class at Ekapada, yeah. the last thing I want to be is irresponsible and get people forcing the leg behind their head. So uh, uh, taking the role as teacher, I take the Guruji hat and go, okay, here's my students, I've got to make sure I look after them. We're going to do Ekapada, Let's give them a step-by-step -step way through into it yeah. and research it. And so, uh, having worked quite extensively with David Kyle, uh, who is a an advocate for double pigeon or agony stambhasana, yeah, okay. I find in my own practice if I slip a quick agony stambhasana in, then ekapada is is so much easier. Yeah. Um, in my own practice complete own practice, which I hardly ever do now as a complete John self practice, because I'm usually practicing, as you know, with my Yeah, with your with assistants. And but in my own complete practice, I follow tradition. I'm a first, second, third series practitioner. My travel always brings me back to first, and I'm always building up to my third to be able to practice continuously at that level is very difficult when you travel. And so in my own practice, I have to add some of these things in uh, to, to mean that I can keep maintaining my practice and practicing at that level. I'm not losing my direction. I'm not going off the rails. I'm just having a little side tangent to come back in. It's working intelligently. Yeah. For each individual. Yeah. And For it's example, be I did have a knee uh, injury way, way back, and I was using a towel to protect the knee. Sharat said to me, no towel. I, so I didn't use the towel. Yeah. Went to Guruji, and he understood the process that my knee was going through. Yeah. He said, you use towel. Yeah. And so it, it wasn't countering what Sharat was saying. It was just that... Guruji was appreciating that I was working intelligently. Yeah. It had, I'd incorporated the use of the towel in my vinyasa without interrupting my flow or sequence. You could see that I was using it intelligently, and when the towel wasn't required, the towel wasn't used. Is, is there a, a chance, I'm thinking of my own practice as well now, and I, you can get caught up in your own stories or your own... I must do this before I do that because otherwise I can't do it. And do we have to be careful of that too? There will come a day when we really no longer need to do that, whatever it is, before we do this particular thing. Well, the practice isn't going to go like that and yeah. then we die. Yeah. We're going to have to let things go. Yeah. Guruji used to, in his mala, yoga mala, just the, just the sun salutes. If you just do the sun salutes, we all have a prosperous life. Maybe only standing postures, this life. Maybe only this life, primary series. If you're doing primary series, then second series is good to complement it. Mm. If you're able to do first and second and you're progressing into third, he used to say third series was for demonstration purposes. The demonstration purposes was to attract the people into the practice. Right. When Guruji did a demonstration through Sharat, he wasn't calling them out in the sequence. He'd call out according to how he wanted to demonstrate. Right. As we get older, we're going to have to let things go. Um, 
especially if you have interrupted practice. If you can keep a daily practice, then that point of letting go won't be so dramatic. So dramatic. But, um, you know, 70, do you really need to be putting your leg behind your head? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. I want to ask you, John, one more question, because we're, I'm watching the sun, the sun and yeah. we wanna, we're going to be filming a, a demo as well, and we've got to allow time for that. Um, Not that sort of demo. Yeah, yeah. So we were talking about uh, a lot of women unsure about how to practice during their cycle. Um, what should they be doing? I believe that uh, when Guruji would say, first three days of the period, no practice. Right. Uh, period, ladies' holiday. I understand in India, I might be incorrect here, but I understand in India, it's three days for a period for women. Anything longer than that is considered out of balance. So in the West, periods do tend to last uh, a variation from very short to very long. If you're practicing with your period, you're using bandha, and that's the complete opposite to practice, uh, sorry, to the complete opposite to menstruation, letting the, the, letting the downward go. flow. If you are practicing without bandha, which is possible to do, then you're unprotected. You have lower back pain, you could be uh, vulnerable in your hamstrings. So some of the clients that come to you with that sit bone pain yeah. could be just as a result of practicing on period. Right. And being unprotected. When Guruji would qualify a little bit, he would say, uh, no lifting, no ladies work, kitchen work meaning it was a holiday from physical activity. But the moment that you're be being physical, then we are holding in. Mm. That will slow the period down. If you allow yourself to have your period, it might fall to a three-day cycle. But people's experience of periods are like so vastly different, aren't they? From something very light to something very dramatic. Um, well, this is an invitation to all women teachers. All women <laughs> teachers. <laughs> Sorry, that was me just playing with my mic. <laughs> um, to realize that there is a shift from the majority of men being in class to the majority being female in the class. It's, we're just at the whole new moon set phase of the cycle. And technically speaking, over that dark moon period, if women were all together in a clan, they would be menstruating together. Ovulating at full moon, menstruating around dark moon. Full moon off ovulation, dark moon off period. It would fall into to line with that. There is a book called The Mysteries of the Dark Goddess that can tell you how to time your period with the moon. But if we're teaching this in a male way, then that's what happens. Right. And I hear it out there, yang, that Ashtanga is yang, and that there's yin yoga. That's a cross-cultured borrowed term. Yin and yang cannot be separated. There has to be a certain amount of yang. If there's a majority of yin, there's still a little bit of yang. If there's a lot of yang, there's a little bit of yin. I liken it to, to stera, suka, steady, comfortable, yin, yang. That has to be balanced. Mm. Or you could say rajas, tamas. Rajas, tamas has to be balanced for the practice to be sattva. We're looking for a balance. This is, this is a balanced yoga system. Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga is not a yang practice. You can make it yang if you misunderstand it. Practicing on your period is misunderstanding it and making a feminine body, potentially a masculine mm. body, losing its period. That's the worst case scenario. And we've had success with women regaining their periods by observing a moon day right. or a period day. And we can bring the period back by suggesting, okay, if you haven't been having a period, let's start taking dark moon off. Let's take three days off of a dark moon and let your body start to get into a natural rhythm, yeah. not a patriarchal, materialistic, western male pattern of, of behavior. Let's go back to honor the feminine. And that's where the opportunity for female teachers to say, okay, each moon day is a 
a feminine day practice. Right. They could do a period practice on the dark moon, which could be a yin type practice. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Bolstered, uh, which we, I give. Yeah, I saw a few yeah. people doing that yeah. in the Charlotte. Yeah. 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 Cool. We're going to have to leave it, John. Okay. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. And I hope, guys, you really enjoyed that. And of course, we're going to grab John wherever we can. So this won't be the last <laughs> one, I can assure you. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Stu. Cool. Absolutely great. Happy New Year. Yeah. Yeah.